Our second panel now uh, of ICCM that will focus specifically on the conflict management angle of crisis mapping and the kind of technologies that we're speaking of. We've got some really great panelists as well. The panel itself is supported and moderated by USIP, in particular Theo, but big thanks to Shil uh, Sheldon Himmelfarb, who's been a supporter at USIP of uh, our Crisis Mappers Conference for a few years now, so that's very, very good. And we'll be basically doing the same kind of setup with the moderation and the questions. You can tweet your questions to ICCM if you're watching us from the internet, and we'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Patrick. Good afternoon. I'm Theo Dolan with the US Institute of Peace. And I'd like to thank the organizers for enabling us to host this session on the use of new technologies and mapping for peace building. Uh, so I, I, I don't have nearly as good an icebreaker as with the previous session. So let me just start by very briefly mentioning U USIP's role in supporting crisis mapping and peace building. Uh, so since 2009, we've been a committed and innovative supporter of crisis mapping technologies, and I'll just give a couple of examples. USIP has funded uh, crisis mapping efforts in Haiti in 2009, and this led to um, an, uh, a special report that translated short-term <coughs> impacts on the ground into valuable lessons learned for future deployments. And this, again, was back in 2009. In 2010, we uh, were a co-sponsor of this very conference in Boston. Uh, a year later, in 2011, USIP partnered with Ushahidi uh, to create the Universities for Ushahidi training program. This program trained youth leaders from Iraq, Haiti, Liberia, Kenya, and elsewhere in the use of, of crisis mapping technologies in their communities, aiming to create a cadre of next generation peace builders who are equipped with the latest mapping technologies. And to, to end this uh, shameless PR, uh, USAP is also very committed to making crisis mapping a global technology capability that is truly rooted in local needs of conflict-affected communities. And that's why we've supported this year's Crisis Mappers Conference, and that's also why we're hosting this panel. And so that, that provides a nice segue into our panel. Uh, since our excellent list of panelists has a rich and varied experience in contextualizing and customizing uh, new technologies and mapping for on-the-ground peace-building work, and, and also empowering local communities in how to use these technologies. So I, I won't get into the bios. They're all online uh, from the agenda. Um, but let's start uh, first and foremost with Rachel Brown from Sissi Niamani. Thanks, Theo. So I'm going to talk to you a bit today about the work of Sisi Niamani, which means we are peace in Swahili. And our work is really rooted in looking at how communication, the role that communication plays in conflict. And of course, communication in general plays a big role in our everyday lives, how we interact with our surroundings and with each other. But in situations of tension or conflict, communication takes on an even bigger role. It defines what information people have, um, how much information they have. It defines their perceptions of the situation around them and their decision making about which actions to take. So when new technologies or mediums of communication get introduced into day-to-day -day life and really change the way that people communicate, this also then has an impact on how people communicate during conflict. And we really saw this in Kenya in 2007, 2008, post-election violence with the mobile phone. The prevalence of phones throughout Kenya meant that suddenly people could communicate much more quickly to a larger audience and across a larger space, um, across a larger distance than ever before. Um, one use and, and leveraging of this new technology uh, that we've seen was Ushahidi. Ushahidi really capitalized on this new technology to be able to unlock information that usually exists at the local level during conflict, but it stays at the local level. It's not really accessible. But through mobile phones, Ushahidi was able to unlock this information and make it really accessible to responders and media and other key actors. So that was a really positive thing that happened in 0708 in Kenya. At the same time, violent actors and groups wishing to perpetrate violence during the post-election 
um, period, also used mobile technology, and they also used it really, really effectively. Um, the part of it that they tapped into was actually in terms of defining what information people on the ground had, uh, how they perceived the situation, and really influencing their behavior. So text messaging in particular was used to spread fear, rumors, hate speech, misinformation, to incite people to violence, and even to organize attacks. So when I started working in Kenya in 2009, these are some of the things that the local peace activists that I worked with um, initially in Babadogo and Korogocho slums in Nairobi um, said about how text messaging was used in their communities during the violence. So it was used in advance of the elections to make people afraid and really set them up to prepare for violence. Um, insightful messages were sent and they were perceived to have been sent by a very organized group of people seeking to promote conflict. And then finally, uh, text messages were actually used to call people to specific locations where weapons were distributed and attacks were planned. So this was a really negative use of that same new medium for communication. Um, but at the same time, what it demonstrated to us was the potential of SMS-based communication to influence conflict dynamics to give people access to different types of information and influence their decisions and behavior during tensions and conflict on the ground. And it also gave us this sort of ready-made approach um, for how it could work. Um, so what we set out to do is we said, how can we give this same capacity to influence tensions and conflict and put it instead in the hands of local peace activists? And so we worked um, since 2010 to really build this model, which we ended up testing during the recent elections. Um, we tried to, again, learn from what worked for violent actors. We knew that for our approach to work, it had to be rooted in existing social networks, and it had to build on how people were already using their phones. Um, so our approach combined traditional approaches to peace building with new mobile technology. Um, we did a lot of um, policy dialogue, debates, uh, and face-to-face -face outreach for our platform to really build social networks, credibility, and trust in the communities. Um, and on top of that, we, and integrated with that, we, built, we um, used a mobile platform um, where community members were able to subscribe for free from their phones uh, by entering a series of multiple choice questions and giving demographic data, including location, language preference, age, and gender. This let us send targeted messages to our database uh, based on information from our local partners about what was going on. And our messages provided really needed voter education information general peace promotion messages and congratulating people for positive <coughs> behavior uh, when there were tensions, and also violence disruption messaging. When we knew that there was a rumor on the ground or that people were starting to group and discuss whether or not to participate in violence or there was small-scale looting and violence, we were able to send a message in mass to our subscriber base um, and try and interrupt that chain to violence. So this enabled really rapid and effective communication to communities at scale, on the ground, as events were unfolding. So by the time of the recent election in Kenya, we had more than 65,000 subscribers to our platform, and we were working with more than 50 local partners to monitor the situation on the ground and initiate messages. Um, a second thing that we really paid attention to is that we knew we were at an incredible disadvantage with our messages. Um, messages that create fear or have some sort of exciting news get forwarded really quickly. Messages asking you to think twice about a rumor, people don't want to forward those as much, right? So we knew that we had to um, really focus on our content and on making it meaningful to people on the ground. This is sort of what you see on screen is just a chart of part of the process that we went to to develop our message framework. We did a lot of research through focus groups with our target demographics and looking at behavior chains and at which point in a potential conflict would we send messages. So that by the time of the election, we had also worked with a uh, marketing strategist from Ogilvy and Mather to analyze our data and create a messaging framework based on the situation, different situations that could arise on the ground and different groups we would want to target. So during the weeks surrounding the election and the post-election petition, we sent more than 680,000 messages to our uh, 65,000 subscribers. 
And since then, one of the things that we've tried to do is really learn from this experience. We tried something pretty new, and we wanted to see how our subscribers experienced um, our programming, how they experienced the messaging, and how they interacted with it. And because we already had them in our platform, we were able to do two really simple things to collect data. One, we sent out a multiple choice survey, which was taken by 7,350 subscribers on their phone. And two, we were able to call a random sample of subscribers. I'm going to give you a quick peek into some of the things that we found. Um, one thing we were particularly interested in was whether people were interacting with the information we gave them. Was this spam that they were deleting, or were they engaging with it, forwarding it, having conversations? Uh, we found that 75% of subscribers reported having forwarded a message at least once. That means they spent their own money at least once to share the information. Um, secondly, uh, we looked at whether people had conversations, whether they stopped what they were doing to talk about a message. 85% of respondents had done so at least once, and 30% said they were having conversations very often. So this suggested to us people were actually engaging with the messages, we hope. 92% um, of subscribers said that they actually believed that the messages helped prevent violence in their communities. And when we did the follow-up phone calls with a random sample of subscribers, a lot of interesting themes emerged. One of which that's particularly interesting to me is that um, there was this theme of people thinking that there was more awareness about their community than there had been before, that they weren't really existing in a vacuum or off the radar. Um, over and over again, we got this feedback that youth were afraid to participate in violence when they got the messages because they thought that they were being watched. Um, but we also got feedback from people saying they felt more relaxed getting the messages, knowing someone was paying attention to their area, and it gave them the security they needed to stay inside, even with small-scale conflict or looting erupted. So there was this idea that the messages meant someone was paying attention to their area, and they had to think differently about consequences to violent actions in their community. So that's just a quick snapshot of some of the results. I also want to talk to you about some of the lessons that we learned. Um, the first one is that, as with all technologies, it's not an end-all, be-all. SMS is not appropriate for any situation. This was one type of communications-based response that we were experimenting with. Um, the second thing is that more messages can actually mean less impact. People didn't want a barrage of messages. Based on subscriber feedback, what mattered is that they got a message that was relevant to what was going on in their area when it mattered, not that they got them all the time. And this brings me to my next point, which is targeting was key. Um, from our feedback from subscribers, again, it mattered that the messages felt personal and relevant to what was happening in the communities. And this could not be done without a grassroots team, um, without the integration of the mobile with existing social networks, peace building activities on the ground. So again, that um, nexus and integration between on the ground, grassroots networks and peace builders, and the technology was really, really key. And then finally, the ability to partner with other types of responders was really important for us. Um, you'll hear from Peter later from the NSC, but there were often issues that we didn't think a communication-based response was sufficient or even appropriate. And we were able, through our networks that we had built prior to the elections, to contact relevant people who could have an on-the-ground response. So these are some of the lessons that we've thought through during and since um, the elections. And the last thing I want to go through is just what I think are some challenges for the future. Um, because I think, for me, what some of our, what the feedback that we've gotten from our subscribers has shown is that there is some potential to this approach. Um, it looks like it has some potential to make a difference, but there's, this is the tip of the iceberg, and there's a lot more that we need to explore and understand if we want to move forward in any way. Um, one thing we're looking at now is how can we create long-term engagement with the platform. So if we have the platform, um, how do we continue to create conversations and be a credible source of information, even between elections? Um, I'll skip quickly through. Uh, refining feedback loops for scale, the uh, process of getting information and verified information from communities um, who suggest messages, having that moderated and then go back out. How can we refine that and make it more fluid um, so that it could be scaled up? How can we better measure impact um, of this and similar interventions? I think that's a really big question. And then finally, um, for me, the exciting uh, 
Next steps are looking at further collaboration. Who's doing similar work or relevant work and how can we talk together about what works and what doesn't and how we can be continually aware of new communication channels and mediums that can and are being used by violent actors and how we can really stay a step ahead to use these same mediums to influence information and behavior but for peace. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh Next is uh, Helena Pusch, who's an independent consultant. I uh, spend most of my time working as a freelance consultant, and um, my role is often to go and work with peacebuilding teams on the ground. So I spoke yesterday about the work that I was doing with Mercer Corps in their Iraq and Libya programs. Um, and I go in often to help uh, peacebuilding teams think about ways that they can use technology to enhance their programs. Um, and so uh, you, it's a very difficult act to follow because Rachel has just given you this fantastic uh, on the ground, very concrete example. Um, I'm going to do almost the complete opposite, which is that I'm going to talk about the general lessons that I've been seeing and the patterns that I've been seeing in the work that I've done uh, on introducing technology to peace building programs. And I will give you a few examples, but I'm not going to focus on one. The three main challenges that I observe with, uh, with peace building teams when we start talking about technology. And a lot of these have already come up in previous panels, but I want to talk about them a little bit from the angle of peace building in particular. So the first one is um, the idea of the bias of connectivity. Um, and what I mean about that is that too often when peace building teams are thinking about how to use technology, they think that the main reason to introduce technology to a program is to reach more people. And that's simply not the case. Um, in the same way that any other, uh, that any other uh, programming approach has to be seen as a way of reaching more people, but also of reaching key people, with technology it's exactly the same. The reason I say that is that um, uh, when, we, when we think about uh, the bias of connectivity, what we need to think about is not um, which technology is going to reach the most number of people in this context, but is a particular technology reaching a specific group that is of interest to a peace building program? So to give you an example, um, often I'll find that, uh, that in, in countries where there is not great internet connectivity, teams will say, you know, we don't really want to do anything on social networks or on the internet because it doesn't reach enough people. But when we talk about who is using those social networks or uh, particular internet technologies, we'll find that it's young people in urban areas who are often also the people who start rumors in a tense situation in a conflict context. So actually using uh, social networks can be a very relevant intervention if that's your target group. So for me, kind of talking about this bias of connectivity it, at the beginning of talking about how to introduce technology in peace building is very important. Linked to it is also to start thinking about how uh, different technologies can be manipulated by powerful actors in a conflict context. So in, often in a, in, in, a, in a conflict context, you have not only informal, but also some formal actors who have an interest in manipulating technologies. Uh, so particularly in, in repressive environments, you have to be very careful about what messages are actually going to get through when you design an intervention that uses technology. Can it be blocked by a formal or an informal actor? Uh, can the same channel be used in a negative way as Rachel was, was, uh, was mentioning? So that's my first challenge, the bias of connectivity. The second one um, is something which, I mean, you can call it in many, in many different ways. I like to think about it as thin engagement. Um, people often refer to it as well as clicktivism. Um, so this is the idea that, um, you know, we, we think that uh, technology is going to help us to reach more people and to reach them in different ways, and it's going to be very interesting and very creative. Um, but it can also be a way of uh, making engagement a little bit meaningless. Uh, so it can also result in a situation where people are simply clicking through or simply, and, and I don't mean to demean the, the work of Sisi Niamani, but simply reading a message, right? And so the key, for example, in, in Sisi Niamani's work and in other similar work is to look at what happens after that message is read, which is why the charts that Rachel was just showing us of whether people forwarded the message or whether they engaged in a conversation are so important, right? So what we often talk about with, uh, with the peace building teams is how do we differentiate in between thin forms of engagement through technology and thick forms of engagement through technology, through things like surveying how people are using the, the text messages. Um, so that's my, that's my second thing. And actually, I wanted to give an example here. Um, I volunteer for an organize, organization called Solia. 
And Salilla is um, an organization that uh, brings together university students, um, mostly from North America, to discuss uh, controversial issues with students from, from what they term uh, predominantly Muslim uh, cultures. And so um, they, they come together online and they have these very engaging discussions. And to me, this is a great example of how uh, you know, a social interaction online can be an opportunity for extremely thick engagement, for something that is life-changing for these students and is not just any other online conversation or any other online interaction that they would have through Facebook or through Twitter. So that's my second challenge, uh, to how to get around uh, problems with thin engagement. And then the final one um, is an issue of, of, uh, of ethics. And we've talked, the previous panel talked a little bit about the, the ethics and uh, privacy and security issues of data and of online data. Um, and I think this is something which applies to any kind of information or communications technologies that we use in peace building, particularly when we are in a repressive environment or in a conflict environment. And it's that teams really need to think about what are the ethics of the risks that they're exposing people who use these technologies to. And I want to add a, another kind of loop to that question because we often kind of get stuck at, you know, we're exposing people to risk if they engage with this technology. I think we need to get a, go a step further and ask, are the beneficiaries of peace building programs willing to take that risk when they're informed? So we often stop at this idea of there's a risk and therefore we should not expose people to that risk. But very often people, and particularly peace activists who are working in conflict environments, are willing to take that risk. It just has to be an informed risk. That's the real ethical question, is to make it an informed risk, not whether or not they're taking that risk. Okay, so those are my three challenges. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, by the end of this, I'm, I'll actually have mastered the clicker. Um, and, uh, and so from those three challenges, um, there are two lessons uh, that I've learned in, uh, in looking at, um, at, peace, at use of technology in peace building programs. The first one is that, the first one is that um, we have to really focus on designing for engagement. Um, and the first point of this is to focus not on a technology, but on what the function that you want a technology to perform is. And this goes back again to something that Rachel brought up about you know, text messages were very relevant in this context, but they're only one form of communication. And uh, it, too often when you come into peace building teams that don't have much of an exposure to technology, they will say, I wanna use Ushahidi, because they've heard about it. Or, um, you know, I, I think we, sh we need to start looking at Facebook. And it's like, okay, well, forget about Facebook or about Ushahidi. Why would you want a map? And why would you want to engage in a social network? What are the functions that these technologies play that have a, an impact on the, peace on the peace and conflict dynamics that you're seeing? Um, so um, within that, there are two kind of additional questions that I often introduce. One is that we have to pay attention to the expectations that, we, that we're raising. And the second one uh, is that we have to make sure that we find ways to measure impact so that in designing for em empowerment, we're also putting in measures of impact. The second um, lesson that I've learned is that it's really important that we start listening to peace builders. Um, and I, I actually think this is what makes Sisi Niamani's work um, so remarkable, is that they listened to what the peace activists and the community were saying about the conflict dynamic that, that, was, that had happened, and then responded to that with an intervention. Uh, crucial to this listening to peace builders is uh, listening to how technology is already having uh, a role in the conflict dynamic. So to give you an example, uh, which, is, which actually reminds me a lot of, the, of Sisi Niamani, in Kyrgyzstan, um, I was there recently working with UNDP, and one of the things that we talked about was how rumors spread during the violence in 2010, and how they spread over blogs, how they spread over Facebook, and how they spread over YouTube. And what interventions could be done to target those uh, particular uh, existing conflict dynamics using technology. Okay, so with those three challenges and two lessons, here comes um, the, the thing that I think is the, our main missed opportunity, um, which is I think that we need to look beyond um, data processing for crisis response or data processing for early warning um, and two other uh, technologies that can be used um, and other aspects of the peace building programming cycle. Um, so we need to look at, um, at gaming, we need to look at online dialogue platforms, we need to look at other forms of communication 
that can help peace building. Um, I find that the focus on, uh, on data processing and crisis response is too often driven by the technologies that have become better known to peace builders. And we need a, to get away from that. And so I'll close by just telling you very quickly um, that I'm trying to, uh, to get a conversation started on this, and I would love you to join it. Uh, we're organizing a conference that will hopefully discuss uh, a lot of the issues that are being touched on on this panel, but in greater detail. And we've also started a database. The, the, uh, the link is there. And this database basically um, is trying to collect as many peace building programs that uh, use technology as possible and expand the conversation beyond crisis response and data processing. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Helena. Uh, now we turn to Peter Mwamachi with the Kenyan National Steering Committee for Peace Building and Conflict Management. My name is Peter Mwamachi. I'm with the National Steering Committee on Peace Building and Conflict Management. It is a, a quasi-government institution based within the Ministry of Interior and Coordination of National Government. Basically call it NEC. And uh, NEC came about as a bridge between the civil society organizations and the government entities to try in the peace building area to bring this together. So you'll find the NSC is wide and uh, it is composed of, uh, of uh, civil society organization, regional organizations, the UNDP, that is the UN organization, government departments that you find uh, like the police, the NIS, it is the intelligence services, the defense forces, and all those, but uh, we run it as a secretariat, and uh, it came into force in the year 2002. So we've been, we've been working since 2002 in, in Kenya. And uh, among the things we've been doing, apart from coordination of peace initiatives in the country, we've also been dealing with conflict early warning. This stemmed through the IGAD, for those who know the C1 mechanism, that is the conflict early warning and early response mechanisms of the mechanism of the intergovernmental authority on development, that uh, that was one of our activities, initial activities, actually dating back in the year 2002. And uh, in Kenya, we we worked as the Seweru, conflict early warning and early response unit. So we would uh, respond to all those issues that would be raised, and. Uh, now, fast forward to the year 2007, after the post-election violence that we had, uh, the NSC was mandated to <coughs> was mandated to domesticate the C1 mechanism because one of the things we realized is that uh, the early warning mechanism, which had been uh, employed in the pastoral areas, had actually worked so well such that in those areas we did not experience as much conflict. So 2007, we started the process of domesticating uh, the conflict early warning and therefore we came up with the national conflict, <coughs> national conflict early warning and early response system. It's basically a web-based platform where members of the public and uh, various actors can share the information with us for purposes of early response. So that is how we came about. We actually uh, piloted the tool during the 2010 referendum and uh, we're very happy because it actually contributed a lot to the peace that we experienced during that time between the yes and the no. So from there on now we, uh, we rolled it out completely. So I'll just briefly uh, look at the process that uh, we use in uh, the collection of information. And uh, if you can see, uh, we don't rely on only one source when it comes to collection of information. We have the media uh, as, uh, as one of the components. And you realize that in Kenya, the media is very active. There's a lot of information that comes through the media. Uh, so we are able to tap in. We have a situation room at our office where we are able to tap in to get to view a number of the information that is coming in through the media. You'll find that in some of the instances, the media guys are already there on the ground when, some, when things are happening, so we are able to capture, to capture that. Then, uh, of course, we have the NSC structures. Uh, for purposes of authenticity, we have what we call peace monitors and field monitors. These are guys who are based in the field, and they send us what we call situation reports, uh, incident alerts, incident briefs. So they are able to actually gather this information and send it to us. In some instances, they act as our verifiers of the information. Then, of course, we have uh, what we call crowdsourcing. 
we have uh, a short code, 108, that uh, we actually got through the Communication Commission of Kenya. So this is something that, uh, unfortunately, at the moment, it's only uh, Safaricom subscribers who are able to use it. So people can send us short messages for a minimal fee of one shilling. So they're able to just send a message, and uh, in real time, we get that information. So that actually in a nutshell, tries to gather information not only in urban, because uh, as we'll be moving forward, I'll be explaining some of the challenges that we have been having, and one of them would be technology. You'll realize that uh, if you are only to rely on SMS, you'll find that uh, a huge majority of the country are not able to access that. Again, if you are to rely on um, the NSC structures probably would not be able to resource ways to sustain peace monitors across all the country. And even if we had all of them in the 47 counties, some of these counties are very vast. You will not be able to get that information in real time. So we have to try and see that uh, the sources that we use to gain the information, in as much as they, they all rely on technology, they are as wide as possible. So then, of course, the other two, I would not want to belabor so much on them because uh, we have. Um, we have the verification process that follows. And basically on that one, uh, the fact that we have three sources, in some instances they cross-reference each other and they make our work easier. Because if you've gotten information through SMS and you see it on the media being covered live, that already makes, uh, determines the credibility of that information. Or if we call the peace monitors or if it is the government entity that is there, then of course that one determines the credibility of that information. And then finally we have the dissemination because this information has to be used. And that is one of the things that we've been challenging is when you gather the information, you're gathering the information for what? So that aspect is very critical for us as the government because we're saying the information is not just for purposes of being uh, put in some beautiful charts and stuff like that. It has to be put into use. So. There's that element of dissemination where we develop policy briefs, where we give uh, alerts, and these ones are shared with the various actors because at the analysis level, we determine who is the key respondent. There are those instances where we would give the information to Sisi Niamani because we believe they are stronger in specific geographical areas. There are instances when the information can only be handled by the police who are actually with, last with them one on one. There are instances when we know this can only be done through the IBC. Like for instance, uh, <coughs> this slide shows some of the information that we give to IBC, and uh, that is the electoral body of the country. One is actually the the slide on um, on my left. On my left is actually during the election. Yeah, this one. <laughs> on your side, it will be it will actually be that one. Okay, so that one we actually did it during the elections and uh, it was showing some of the risks uh, that uh, we had uh, gathered. This other one is actually the latest, is actually for this month that we shared with IBC and they used uh, the IDEA project to put it in the maps like that and it shows the number of information or the information that we have received in, that is Bungoma. We are having a by-election in Bungoma on 19th of this month so we are trying to help them we gather the information and give them so that as they plan for the by-election, they are aware of the, uh, of the risks, okay? So that is just but some of the, of the end products of this information that we're getting. Others, there are a lot. There are those policy briefs that I've said that we share even with the president, even with the, uh, the other security entities. Okay, so now, uh, my last slide, uh, three very critical issues. I will start with the challenges, and I think uh, they really talk to what my, my co-panelist here was talking about, and I actually thought she must have had a preview of my, of my slide before coming here. But uh, of course, the first one is uh, resources. That is something that is very common. I don't think at any one point any group has had uh, sufficient resources to undertake uh, fully what they have wanted. Then, uh, of course, we have uh, coverage. And in this case, we are talking of uh, actually covering the entire country is an issue. It is actually 
a big task to cover a one, one province. We have some places that uh, have poor infrastructure. They are very wide. You know, places like, uh, I don't know if you'd be aware of, but the northern frontier where we have the Turkanas, the Marsabit, the Garissa, the Wajia, those are very huge places with very poor infrastructure. So in some instances, you might find a kettle raid, kettle rustling happened the day before, but uh, then the information would only come two days after because somebody had to walk a number of, uh, of miles to go and actually get a place where there's network coverage. Okay, then of course technology. Technology, yes, is there, but it's an issue, okay? In some instances, we have a problem where uh, technology is not compatible, you know? There are a number of issues with technology. I'm sure you are all technology guys. You'll, when I say technology, you understand now that I'm being told my time is up. Then uh, we have competing interests. We all have different needs, we all have different uses for this information. So you'll find probably for me as the government or as the government representative, I'm looking at this information either as being very sensitive or I'm looking at it as saying this information can be handled within the country. But because, uh, and uh, sorry to say that, probably a civil society wants to get money from the donors, they would move with that information and say, okay, we want, we want funds to be able to do this. So we have various competing interests that actually hinder, hinder this work. And now that competing interest really brings a lot of suspicion and at times we're really not able to talk together or even if we talk together, we, we are not able to get to a common ground then uh, lessons, we are saying there's a lot of, uh, we recognize the power of partnerships. Uh, why I say that is that uh, through the partnering like with Sisi Niamani, we are able to reach to a number of places that uh, on our own would not have been able. So the information that they got complemented the information that we got. In some instances, it uh, verified or we verified their information. So there is really need to partner. And again, here, it doesn't mean only peace building uh, people, because uh, you'll find that uh, like the information we had, we gave it to IEBC and they were able to develop those maps and all that. For us as the NSC, we might not have the expertise, we might not have the capacity. So there's need to enhance the partnerships with if it is the technological uh, guys and stuff like that, that would definitely improve all our work. So we are able to actually come up with products that uh, uh, that uh, can be consumed. Then uh, we have uh, uh, the strength of information and technology, the positives and the negatives. I think that one was spoken to very clearly here. I don't think I need to be labor on that. Then uh, inclusivity and participation at the local level. I think one of the strengths that uh, Sisi Niamani has had is that uh, uh, the local community seems to feel them, to understand them. Okay, they have made them feel part of their work. So that way, when there's ownership, we find that uh, normally peace prevails, that uh, the information that you give out is normally accepted. So that inclusivity is really important. And of course, that one again also comes with trust. But trust again comes with, when you're given information, are you able to work on it? And are you able to get back to these people and tell them the information that you gave us, this is what we've, we've done with it? Because in a number of instances, we receive a lot of information, but we do not get back to the senders of in this information and tell them, this is what has happened to the information. So somebody would send you a message today, uh, they'll send you tomorrow, tomorrow but on, but because there's no feedback mechanism to tell them what has been done with that information, then they tell you, okay, thank you, I will not be sending you any more information. Okay, then on the way forward, one of the critical things that we have discovered as a country is that uh, for this thing to move forward, this need for policy and coordination. During the election, and uh, I think one, one of the persons here wrote asking why so many platforms and all that. The thing is, um, during that time, we had over 30 platforms actually dealing with the uh, conflict early warning and early response. Right now, if you look at or you ask where are they, you wouldn't find them, okay? So the thing is, how are we able to give a policy direction when it comes to conflict early warning and early response? And that is something that uh, we are trying to sit down and uh, come up with and try to see how then are we able to coordinate because we also don't uh, need to be confusing the public. The public sends a message here, they send a message there, they send a message to another platform and stuff like that. So then of course gender and uh, early warning, I think that is quite straightforward. I will not, I'll not touch on it. Then uh, technology for early warning and early response, we believe that there's still a lot of room. And uh, coming from NSC, I'm very glad to participate in this because we believe that um, 
Technology can really enhance peace, not only in Kenya, but in Africa and in the world. So the question is, for those of us who have more knowledge on technology, how are we going to customize that uh, technology or that knowledge that we have in technology for better of uh, peace initiatives? Okay. Then uh, linkage between early warning and uh, early response, there's always a gap. Information comes in early for early warning, but then early response is an issue. In some instances, I might get the information early warning, early enough, but then I might not be able, I might not be the person doing the response. If, for instance, some uh, cattle rustlers have been spotted in a particular area, I have been given the information. My duty is only to pass the information to the officer commanding a particular place, but that, that officer might not have enough capacity or might not do anything. So at the end of the day, you find that there's information that has been sent for early warning, but there has been no early response. Okay? That one happens a lot, and uh, so we are trying to see by bringing on board even the responders, looking at the policies, looking at the issues that can be corrected so that we just don't talk of early warning, but we are also able to talk about early response. And then, of course, the, finally, it's the issue of reducing the risks. Reducing the risks is basically trying to get the entire community to understand. When you talk of technology, what do you mean? When you talk of uh, technology in early warning, how do you mean and how are they able to accept it? How are they able to own it? Okay, because at some point then you might find if uh, really you haven't looked at all the risks that would come with the using technology, then you're going to expose some of these people. As you're saying that uh, they would be willing to take the risks, but I can assure you at the end of the day as a practitioner, you don't want somebody to tell you that uh, they're willing to take the risks, but then somebody in the process loses their life. You, it is something that you end up, even if they accepted, you will feel it for the rest of your life that probably uh, you exposed somebody to a risk that they, they were ready to take, but in the process they, uh, they lost their lives or something bad happened to them. So with that, I wish to say Asanteni Sana. Okay, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, we've, we've heard some very specific lessons learned, uh, challenges and opportunities for using new technologies and mapping in the peace building field. And before we get into the discussion, I, I would like to introduce uh, Caleb Gichui. He's a program officer for Rachel's organization, Sisi Niamani, and he's led training uh, and activities for Sisi Niamani, as well as managing the SMS platform during the 2013 general elections. So when, when Helena says, listen to the peace builders, we, we have the opportunity to do that during this uh, discussion session. Um, so with that, uh, rather than summarizing some of the key points, I'd like to start with a question. And it's something that uh, I, th I believe Rachel and Peter touched on briefly, which is in a conflict-affected environment, um, are trusted sources and verifying information even more important? And are there different challenges involved with, with those two aspects? And, and how do you deal with that? Um. I think that's a really interesting question. Uh, for us, one thing that was interesting is that in a lot of work that we were doing, knowing that there was a rumor and that something was widely believed because of the type of response that we wanted to have and because it was really communication-based was enough for us. Um, we did try and verify information, and of course, if there was something more extreme going on, uh, we would go to extra lengths to verify it so we could report it to NSC and that there could be action taken. But a lot of our work was actually focused on information flows surrounding conflict. So knowing that a rumor can be just as damaging as an actual event when it comes to conflict. Uh, so for example, what, rumors were one of the things that we were monitoring. Was there a rumor going around that ballot boxes had been spoiled and replaced during the elections? Was there a rumor that a certain group was moving from a certain area to another? If that information was true, we were able to verify and pass it along. But if it was a rumor, that was enough for us to take action with a message. Because one of the points of our messaging was to ask people to interact differently with the information that they were getting. When they heard a rumor, asking them to avoid being manipulated by that rumor, ask where it came from. And some of the responses and feedback we got from subscribers is that um, and, and we had several instances where we heard of a rumor that was going around and we sent a message telling people not to be manipulated by rumors in that area. And we had response and even um, some people calling in to our uh, 
office line telling us, oh, we got the message, so people started asking where did that information come from, and then the rumor stopped being spread. Um, that's very anecdotal, but I guess, um, I guess it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, if you're going to have a response, it's important to know whether the information is accurate or not. But on the other hand, it's important to also take action on something um, like a rumor, even if it's not true. Well, I, I think uh, verification of information to me is one of the trickiest parts when it comes to early warning. Because uh, from experience, if a person wants to, to, to mislead you, it's very easy for them to do so. But uh, at the end of the day, one thing comes in is that uh, one, any person verifying information has to be knowledgeable of the situation, has to understand the context. So if I can give you a real, a real uh, example is that um, if uh, there's, a, there's a media report, so we read a media report and you see that, uh, or uh, you, watch, you watch it on telly and you find that uh, uh, there's an allegation that uh, a particular community has attacked the second community. So what you do, first of all, you look at the reporter. Where is that reporter coming from? Because most of the time, Actually, I would say 90%, they have tended to, to be biased. So from there now, you start uh, actually reducing the sensation, sensationalization of that information. So you'll find that uh, that is one step. So they will report, probably it's true, yes, but they will give you uh, something slightly more. Then now you need to get to the other side, to the other community. And then they'll also have their own allegations. Okay? Because in all the places we have point persons. So again, you also get to the administration. Those ones, again, they might not give you the correct picture because they are also afraid that they might be deemed not to have been working. So at the end of the day, you have to cross-reference with all the sources that you have. And that is why we really insist on having as many sources as possible. Okay? And then from there on, now you deduce on your own at some, in some instances, the level of credibility. In most cases, at least there would be some level of credibility. Of course, in, initially, some years ago, would have some of the reporters probably giving you a completely misleading information. But uh, of course, with time, then you're able to sieve them through and know who actually is able to give you uh, the proper version of information. But verification is very, is very tricky, is very critical, and I think it, it is on a on a case-to-case -case basis. You cannot uh, look at it in isolation. Okay. So I want I wanted to actually add uh, in a way to what Rachel was saying, which is to say, you know, verification is absolutely very important when it comes to incidents or events of conflict. Um, but there's no such thing as verification of perceptions. And perceptions are very important drivers of conflict. Now, we do need to be aware of the biases of perceptions, right? Um, but that just means whose perception is that? Um, and I wanted to add two other examples of uh, situations where technology has been used to analyze perceptions um, in, in support of peace building activities. Uh, one is a project in Sudan of which there are several representatives in the room. It's the Crisis and Recovery Mapping and Analysis Project. They're actually a sponsor of this, of this event as well. And, uh, and that project in Sudan went around and collected perceptions data from communities and used that to help uh, different actors do conflict analysis of Sudan and target their interventions. The second one is a project that uh, UNDP and an organization called SEED and Interpeace are working on in Cyprus. Um, and they are putting together a social cohesion and reconciliation index that basically does uh, very, very uh, detailed polls of uh, perceptions of different groups on the island um, and perceptions towards each other. So you know what the bias is. So it's what, do the, you know, what does this group think about this group with respect to this particular issue. And they're putting that on a very uh, easy to use interactive public platform so that everybody can begin to engage with these perceptions and begin to have a more informed dialogue about what social cohesion and reconciliation looks like on the island. Uh, maybe just to add on that, um, there's one thing we normally do when we go out to the field and uh, we're training this, um, the peace monitors. Um, they, one of the th key things we actually uh, <laughs> want them to understand is 
know the type of rumor. Don't just report any type of rumor because as we know, it keeps on, like a rumor spreads and changes very fast. So it can start as one thing, by the time it's reaching to you, it's already changed to something else. So you're actually responding to something that is non-existent has already changed. So one of the key things we actually, when you're training them is to help them and uh, equip them to understand this type of room, whatever rumor is going around because uh, Actually, it varies from different, situ uh, different areas to areas. So where uh, one rumor would mean something totally serious in one place, and we'd have to respond to it immediately. But in another place, actually, a chief would respond to it more effectively than even an SMS. So one of the key things also is to equip them with that, uh, just to understand what type of rumor it is. It Does it require an SMS response? Can it be dealt in another way? Not only just to keep on reporting to us all type of rumors that comes their way. Yeah. Okay, so let's open it up to you. Um, any questions from from the field? We've got uh, from the, uh, from web, the live stream. We've got a couple of questions. Uh, one is, how do you? Uh, this is uh, first two is to um, Rachel. How do you manage the information that you're collecting? Do you keep records of text messages sent and received, and and also a contacts log? And also, what was the name of the marketing marketing company that you um, you collaborated with? So I don't forget to answer it. Uh, we had a consultant visit us pro bono for two weeks from Ogilvy and Mather, which is an agency based in New York. Um, just to mention also, I didn't get a chance during the presentation, we've also collaborated with a lot of different groups to bring in different types of expertise into the work that we're doing. So there was marketing from Ogilvy and Mather, but we've been part of a bigger group, which Patrick, who's here, is also part of, um, called Peace Text, which is really looking at the broader context of when mobile technology can or can't be integrated into local peace building programs. Um, in terms of managing the information that we got, um, Maybe Caleb will want to add something to this. But uh, we didn't crowdsource information. There was a lot of crowdsourcing going on in Kenya, and we're a really tiny organization. So we didn't want to ask our network of 65,000 people to send us text messages. Uh, we did get people calling and texting in anyways to our office line, which was supposed to be a technical helpline for people <laughs> having problems with the platform. It got used in other ways. Um, so we dealt with that information when it came in. And if people did text into the platform, we did monitor that, and we do have records. But most of our information was through our local partners and local networks. Um, these were people that we'd worked with. and. Um, we trained them, but really it was more of a collaborative training. It was working with them to understand dynamics of conflict in their areas and really think through communication flows and how communication in their areas was interacting with conflict and really looking at conflict dynamics so that we'd already thought through all of these processes and all the sort of behavior change that could lead to conflict. And they were really able to pick out in detail, this is happening now, this is the type of message to send. Uh, we kept logs and information of uh, what we received from partners and we had uh, a system whereby our partners each reported to one of our field team members. They would verify and report back to our situation room, at which point we would escalate if need be. Um, it was also our local partners that were, uh, or our field team that was working with the local partners to initiate messages uh, because we had given them pretty extensive training based on the focus group data about uh, messaging framework, tone to use, things to avoid causing alarm or seeming partisan, conditional phrasing to use if you were talking about an event uh, that people might not already know about and could cause alarm, um, as well as how to frame the message. So I don't know, maybe Caleb, you have something to add. Uh, yeah, um, one of the key things that happened actually during the elections when people are sending in messages through a central line, we kept logs of that. And the idea was to try and link, there's um, one message maybe about rumor linked to the, maybe a fifth message about violence, how they related. And uh, also another thing was to, once you get an information and it's not from a, a peace monitor, we'd call them and verify from them. So maybe the information would be from the community, but then we'd have to go back again and verify it using the, our people on the ground and ask them, is this, because I mean, there's so many messages flying around and we have to keep a record and say, okay, this one was a false, this one was a false, this one was a true and things like that. Yeah, so we did. Okay, uh, for us, it was, we wanted to take a, 
first do no harm approach, and we understood that sending a message could cause alarm or have a negative impact. And the reason that we worked so closely with our field team and with our partners was to really, because they had the sense of what was going on on the ground and they had their own networks, to really judge whether a message could cause harm or not. That was the main job of us at sort of the central situation room to moderate, was to receive this verified information, and our field team knew how to verify, and before pressing the send button and letting a message go out, really making sure that there was no way it could have a negative impact on the situation. You're good. Okay. Anyone uh, with a question from the field? I realize we're standing between you and lunch, but we do have 15 minutes. Yes, in the back. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my first question goes to uh, Rachel. I wanted to know um, what, how long did it take you to get a government buy-in, if there was anyone at all? Uh, because what we've seen in Africa is for these kind of initiatives is getting uh, government to buy in into these kind of initiatives. And uh, the second one goes to Elena. Um, I'm very sure some of us here will agree that uh, places that do have conflicts in Africa, there's less uh, internet penetration or the use of mobile technologies there. Uh, has there been anywhere at all that you've been able to use the community radio, which is a, an alternative we've been looking at uh, when it comes to peace building. Thank you. Okay, okay. Um, okay Rachel's thinking about it, so I'm going first. <laughs> so um, I, um, I do know of a few places where community radio um, has been used. Um, instead of going through general things, I'm just going to give you a very concrete um, example. Um, I worked on a project uh, with a Sudanese uh, NGO called Sudia, and uh, Sudia wanted to uh, basically establish a way for um, people who were living along three nomadic routes in one particular area of Sudan to share uh, information on the nomadic migration and also on uh, peace agreements that were being made between the different uh, not even tries the between the different clans along the along the migration route, and so because there was very limited, um, certainly no internet connectivity and very limited mobile connectivity, what we did is we created a system that combined text messages with a community radio program um, in the area, and so the information there, there were monitors along the along the nomadic routes. They would receive questions, but also send information in to a central system. There was an analyst at the central system who would, uh, who would summarize that information, and then that would be used as the basis for a community radio program. The same people who were, who were texting in would also organize listening groups to listen to the information from the community radio group. Um, now, I should say also, uh, to caveat that whole thing, since you mentioned uh, government buy-in, one of the problems we had was that this project actually didn't get very far because it was not, con not allowed to continue by the government. Um, but it's being uh, repurposed um, and uh, tried out again in a different part of Sudan um, in January. Um, so I'll be very interested to see how that continues. Um, and if you want, afterwards we can talk about a few other places where I know community radio has been used uh, in similar ways. I've heard of projects um, in uh, Somalia that we can talk about, and, uh, and in Zimbabwe, and I'm sure others at the conference have also heard of similar things. Actually, I would just add that there are other organizations like Search for Common Ground and USIP that implement peace building uh, radio programs and media programs that use a curriculum-based approach, um, <laughs> which is a peace building curriculum underlying and entertaining uh, drama program uh, that seeks to change knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors of audiences around peace building. And TV, isn't it? T television, of course. Yeah. Well, and uh, just to add, uh, I think uh, all the C1 member states have actually used uh, community radios to actually enhance that. Uh, so even I think the program you're talking about in Sudan was being funded by the C1 mechanism, no? Yeah, Okay, but uh, I know they have done that in Kenya. They also did that in Kenya. We've had uh, in the Somali cluster. That's basically the northeastern parts. We've had the same actually in the what we call the Karamoja cluster. That is the Turkana and the Pokot, the Pokot side. So it is something that has been done. I would say getting government buy-in from the relevant institutions in Kenya was relatively an easy process for us. I think you've heard from Peter, who's um, part of the NSC, which is the government's national body for coordination of early warning and early response. Um, 
once we were able to meet them and, and talk with them, that they're really open to civil society. I think you've heard from the way that he's talked about that. Um, other institutions that we worked closely with, um, the NCIC, which is a commission on um, cohesion and integration, and specifically focused on hate speech. We had a relationship with them where we could forward issues of hate speech that we heard about. Um, and the Electoral Commission as well, we collaborated with them to get accurate voter education information, which we were sending out to our subscribers. And I think it was really about um, coming to them and not really asking a lot, but showing also what we could offer. So for IEBC, the Electoral Commission, um, they were struggling with civic education and voter education, and so we provided an additional means of assistance. They also held civil society meetings on a pretty monthly or every other month leading up to the election. So I think that there was an openness between the relevant government entities during this most recent election, an openness and a willingness to collaborate um, with civil society. Uh, maybe just to add, I uh, just want to add on, some, um, on the issue about the radio. And uh, this is something actually we did uh, just before the elections where we had um, the co some of the community chiefs in the Rift Valley. We took them to a radio station and just before they were supposed to they actually engage the communities on, on how to vote and things like that on issues about peace. And we actually sent a message out informing the community to listen to the, the chief on this radio station at this time. So that is maybe one of the ways to show how mobile technology and radio works together to bring people to maybe to understand what's going on. Yeah. So. Anyone else? Yes. Um, I have a question on understanding the engagement. How do you guys measure the engagement? It's by the impact. How do you measure the impact then for that engagement that you bring in that local community? How to measure impact? Um, you looked like you wanted to say something. Oh no, I thought you were going to say something. Oh no, I mean, I, I think it's a big challenge, and I think I put it in one of my challenges for the future. For us, we're also a really small organization, and we would have liked to do a lot more to study the impact of the approach that we just weren't able to do, mainly because of resources. But. Um, Again, like I said, because we had a subscriber base, we just tried to gather as much data as we could um, with the resources that we had. And one thing I'm interested in is seeing how we can make that data and information available to people who are looking at this from a broader perspective. I think there's been a lot of, um, especially in Kenya, because there was so much going on before this recent election, really a lot of efforts put into violence prevention. It's really hard to pick apart what had an impact, plus there was a lot going on with the political situation and different political alliances. So there are a lot of people interested now in studying that. So for Sisi Niamani, what we can do right now is just make our data and the information we have available so it can be as useful as possible. In terms of how to measure impact, there's, um, I think a lot of work and information out there on that. It's a matter of having the resource and the willingness um, to invest in that research throughout the process. And I think hopefully even making it, because a lot of these things are new and um, somewhat experimental, making that a really iterative process where you're having the impact research and perceptions research and whatever it is ongoing with the program so that it can keep informing programmatic improvements. I agree with everything that Rachel just said. To add to that, I would say, um, you know, the, the, the issue of measuring impact in peace building, forget about technology, just in peace building, is already a nightmare. Um, it, it's, it's an incredibly difficult thing to do because peace is so, such an elusive concept and it's affected by so many different things. So to isolate the, the impact of any one intervention on a conflict dynamic is, you know, it's pretty difficult. Um, and on top of that, you're adding the technology element. So now you're saying, not only do I want to see how this intervention um, affected the conflict dynamic, but I want to be able to isolate how the technology, the intervention of technology made it more impactful, to, you know, to kind of put it bluntly. So you'd have to control a community where this technology hadn't been available with one that had been, and how, how you know, were there any other differences between the community? It's, it's a very difficult, having tried to structure some of these impact things, it's, it's extremely difficult to do. So I'm gonna point you to one that I think is doing a relatively good job, and I think the reason they are is that they are focusing on changes in attitude, um, which is a little bit easier to measure. So they're not trying to measure how it, the conflict dynamic has changed, they're trying to measure how the attitudes of particular individuals have changed, and then you've gotta make the leap on your own to say that attitude change is going to reduce conflict, right? So, and, and that, this is Salia, which I mentioned earlier, and they're looking at how 
Um, they're doing some, some studies on how these online dialogues are changing the attitudes of people who are engaging in them. Um, so I'd say check that out as an example of something quite interesting in this area. I don't think I have anything to add on that. <laughs> okay, uh, Mark, you had a question? I'm sorry, is this more of a comment on the fo to follow up with regard to radio? <clears throat> because uh, you mentioned some of these uh, programs which are directly um, produced for uh, peace building. And I just wanted to point out, particularly with regard to media, that there are a lot of ways of approaching this which are not necessarily directed toward peace building but have a significant impact. For example, after the 2008, uh, 2008 um, uh, post-election violence, one of the things that um, Internews did was to host a <coughs> gathering of journalists, approximately 80 journalists, and it was just um, 30 days of, uh, of pictures and words, and it was just to reflect or to review all of what they had and how they had reported on those first 30 days, and it was very uh, bracing, if you will, and that led to a series of trainings that went on that were really about going back to learn about some some cases. Kenyan history with regard to um, uh, p violence which had um, occurred years ago and also the various processes that they were not aware of and just becoming aware of um, wh who was responsible in the government for meeting certain conditions to actually move the peace forward. And this changed very much with regard to the reporting that they were doing. And again, it was contributing, it was information for the general population. It was contributing and giving them the tools they needed to actually move forward or the information they needed uh, to move forward. But once again, it was through the media, but it was not necessarily directed um, in the same methodologies as you would have, for example, with uh, radio dramas and, and the like. And this our last point is also, for example, one of the big problems that you had during post-election violence was uh, vernacular radio. And vernacular radio and ethnic conflict is built to fuel it in a lot of ways. And very simply, in some cases, it was a, a question of equipment. Um, you know, a lot of the, the hate speech, for example, came from people who were calling in. It did not come from the radios themselves. And the reason why the, the, the journalists didn't, the, the announcers weren't trained on how to really cut someone off, they weren't accustomed to doing that, and they also didn't have a 10-second delay button. And those are the kinds of technological, uh, you, know, th you know, things that you can do to actually facilitate them to really gain control in situations like that. Fair points. Rachel, did you want to respond? Yeah, I, I wanted to thank you for that comment because I also think it's really important to note we're talking about some specific technologies on this panel, but there's a lot of other things, the media in general and other ways that people access communication that's really important. Um, for us, what's really important here is how do people interact with information? Um, one thing that we saw that wasn't really being combated very well and when we talked to local peace builders that they felt like they didn't have the tools to combat was the way that information was spreading on phones. But that's one of many different things and I think an issue overall and especially in conflict where people are tense they there's a lot of information coming at them including probably someone's coming to get you these are scary situations and people don't usually take the time to question what they're hearing and I do think that this broader sense of no, no, I want to say media literacy, but it's more communication literacy. It's similar to what Jen was talking about earlier. We learn not to believe everything you read in a book. Well, I think that um, in communities where there's a lot of conflict, where there's ongoing rumors and tension, it's not just the information that you get in a conflict setting. It's all the things that you're set up to believe in the context you have beforehand. And so I do think that taking a communications-based approach to peace building needs to look at the overall information context, how people are getting information, what information they're getting, and not just changing what that information is, but changing how they know to interact with it, how to interrogate it um, before making decisions based on that information. Absolutely. Just a follow up. Okay, anyone else would like to comment on the comment? No? Other questions? Something from the live stream? Okay. Yes. Um, hello. Uh, I'd like to pose a question. I guess this is to the panel. Um, first of all, I, uh, the question is around how to get government buy-in. And basically, I'm very glad to see that Peter's on the panel because I think that the whole idea is to make governments eventually do what we're doing, right, is for them to provide these kind of services to the population. So I'm just wondering, and this, go this is going back to the previous question about dealing and partnering with local governments. So how do you ensure that you either partner or work with or build the capacity of local 
uh, and, and other levels of government so that to ensure sustainability of these kind of programs. Thanks. Oh, well, uh, thank you. I hope I'm getting your question well. I think you are asking about uh, how, how do we ensure that uh, there's a proper government buy-in and uh, that it is sustained. Is that it? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, from the word go, I think uh, what we have in most of these instances is uh, one, perception. Either side has a perception, a negative perception of the other. And two, they are then the suspicions. Some of them are real, some are imagined. Okay. So the thing is that it is a matter of identifying the proper body within the government. Because the government is this very big monster. So if you don't go to the right entity, you'd be taken in circles. Because even for, for the government at times, they might really not know which is the exact entity that is dealing with that. So if, for instance, uh, if um, I can give the example of Sisi Nyamani, if they went to, to the police, definitely you can be sure they would have been taken round and round. So the fact that she went to the right entity, then uh, one, it was easier to, to engage, okay, so that means for you to get in, in, in touch with the government, you have also to be aware which is your line, which is the department within the government that, uh, that actually uh, you're supposed to deal with. Then from there on, you have to be very open with the government. Most of these things would probably be new, okay? There's a way in which government does it its things. Even if it's the UN here, they have their procedures. You'll find that some of these procedures or issues cannot be changed overnight. So there's, again, the element of persistence. There's the element of honesty. Because if the government for any reason feels that uh, uh, for any reason probably you're coming and you have some ulterior motive, <laughs> they will just shut the door. Okay? So for you to sustain that, you have to be consistent. You have to show the impact of your work. Because at the end of the day, even the government wants to have a peaceful country. So it, if you can contribute to that peace of that country, then why not, why not interact with you? So, okay, I would say probably Kenya is a bit ahead in that uh, it, has, uh, it has had this uh, entity, NSC, which brings on board uh, the civil societies and the government, but we've also had our own challenges. In some instances, uh, and this has happened, you come and sit uh, on a boardroom like this with civil society organization, then the next thing they go out there and they are on the media, either saying uh, they want to do something that you agreed or actually giving a negative picture. So for me, it is up to the institutions to actually sit down together. And uh, of course, most importantly, there's also the personality at the level. So some of the people we have at the top might not really be uh, keen on that. So actually that also plays, plays a major role. But uh, I would say in Kenya, I'm happy to say that uh, there's actually a lot of uh, acceptability of the civil society organizations. Um, I'd like just to add on something. Um, uh, there's a time I was having actually a training in uh, a place called Transmara in uh, some part in the Rift Valley. and. Um, in the middle of that training, two guys walked in. They were, one was from the criminal investigation department, another guy was from the NSIS, uh, Secu National Security Information Service, Intelligence Service. So they were nowhere in the list. I had, they were not supposed to be there. So at first I didn't know who they were. So I gave them a list to sign, but they refused. So uh, at the 10 o'clock break, they pulled me aside. They asked me, what are you doing here? Who invited you? What is all this program about? And at first I got a bit nervous because, OK, wait. I, we have concern from the chief, but I mean, what's, what's all this? So I explained to them, I explained to them what we're doing, and they told me, where have you done this before? I had to actually to sit them down and I basically walk them through what we're doing, how the platform works. And at the end of the day, they were like, oh, okay, cool, you're coming actually to help us. I said, okay, go on, and they left. It was weird because I, I thought, okay, maybe you'd want to stick around and, and learn something, but, but then again, I thought, um, just warming up to them and telling them, hey, we are not here to harm, we are here actually to do some good, might go a long way because most of the time, what you're saying, perceptions is like, oh, you're here to, to do something wrong. And then I look at them and be like, oh, why are you challenging me? I'm, you know, I'm from this uh, Sisi Niamani. So, I mean, sometimes also just saying, okay, here's what we're doing and being open to them. 
goes a bit, I mean, work works sometimes. Just to add to what was just said, actually, Caleb <coughs> talked about this kind of, you know, this clash uh, that you sometimes see in, of perceptions in between government and civil society. And I found, just to add to this, uh, that um, one of the ways to, to, to kind of manage that confrontation, if it's difficult to manage, of course, open communication, absolutely crucial, of personalities also, is also to bring in a third um, party. And one of the things that I've done in a few programs is to bring in an academic partner. Um, because somehow having an academic partner brings this kind of notion that that's more neutral and that they can somehow sit in between and that they're like neither one nor the other. Um, and so that can be in, in situations where civil society and government really find it difficult to sit together to work on peace building, bringing in the academic partner can kind of help that dialogue get started and build the trust for, the, for a partnership to, to move forward. Yes. Um, I'd, I'd like to make a comment on, the, on, on um, three elements. One is, um, you know, during the, the elections of 2007, a lot of times you don't hear discussion about how data transparency also contributed to the election violence. You know, in our, in our, in our community, we always think about open data as being a good thing. And it is a good thing, but sometimes the impacts, if we're not well prepared for it, are not good. Um, Kenya has always had, since the, uh, the start of multi-party elections in 1992, a history of some electoral violence. But what happened is in 2007 was that where fraud uh, was evident, it was immediately known. Whereas before, where, because first we had live coverage of the election, there were media monitors in every electoral station. So the information was coming real time. It was being reported on all the TV channels real time. So people could react it real time emotionally. Whereas before you sort of heard about it two weeks later, the election had already been announced. The information wasn't really readily available. And I think it challenges us with that when we make information uh, open, we also have to think about the consequences of having that information open. Um, secondly, again, in the context of that election, we discussed earlier about, uh, or it was discussed earlier about ensuring that the context is clear. We think about that Kenyan post-election violence a lot of times in purely political terms. What, again, doesn't come out a lot in the contextual analysis, it was the, the, it was the beginning of the era of high food prices. And October 2007 was actually the time in Kenya in which we had the highest food prices ever. And that doesn't come out in the, in the analysis. So whereas around the world you were having food riots, in Kenya it manifested politically. Or that was the channel through which some of that pressure uh, manifested. Uh, the third thing is I'd like to commend our colleague who talked about the training of the media. Because again, I think that's an area where uh, we have a role to contribute. What, one of my big um, quips or big issues of concern in the Kenyan context, and a lot of time in developing countries, is that people see democratization, and the media a lot of times is trained to think that improving democratization is always negative reporting. You know, research has shown that even with young children, when you, when you show them violence on TV all the time, they have a tendency towards increased violence. Our media in this country pre reports predominantly negative information, and it's very rare, actually, that you will find positive information. And societies become what they see. I think it's a challenge for us, as well as people who uh, analyze data, who present it, to take the responsibility as well to present a, a balanced picture of the information that we have. Because when we consistently present only what is negative, you also um, predispose that society to become what it is that you're showing them all the time. Thanks. OK, three different points there. Um, I? I have a comment on a comment on the comment. Um, I think that what you just um, explained very eloquently is actually a, a great way of also explaining what Rachel was saying earlier about the importance of taking a communications approach to peace building. 
Um, and just to expand on some of what of some of what's been said before, you know, understanding how uh, the changes in technology and the, and how the change, changes in technology are affecting communications and are affecting the media and the spread of information in order to intervene more effectively is very important, right? So you were talking about how because information was more real time, then people were responding emotionally in real time as well. Um, and I think this is the kind of, of change in, in, in the communications process affecting a conflict dynamic that we can only respond to if we engage in using technology also for positive things. So some, I say this because sometimes when, when, when I work with, with peace builders on how they want to use technology for peace building, and this seems like a very big thing, the first thing that we do is we identify how technology is already working to make conflict dynamics worse. So identifying the kind of things that you were talking about now, and then thinking about how we can use technology to turn it around. Um, and to do and to do a, a, a sort of a positive intervention in reaction to that to that negative effect. Well, I, again, I think I, I also agree with you absolutely, and uh, I even thought at some point, like yesterday, we had uh, there was a lot of talk about Westgate and all that, and uh, you could even see at some point the reaction that uh, we were having from the government at some point was actually a sort of uh, to say. Uh, probably influenced by what the media the media was reporting, and you'd find in some instances uh, the media is there yes real time, but whatever they report probably in some instances is ex exaggerated and stuff like that, and that is what at some point now ends up uh, uh, shaping up the response measures, which at some point then uh, because of that kind of reporting then uh, you find that the response is not as good as it should have been. And of course, again, also now the information brings forth to the question of um, when you have this information, if it's early warning information, then who is it for? Uh, early, early warning information for who? Is it for keeps? Is it for, uh, for sharing out? Looking at the consequences that when you share out this information, how many people are you going to scare? How many people are you going to, uh, to convince to probably go and buy arms? Okay, so I think it's a, it's a challenge that at some point you have the information that uh, you are not very sure that uh, if you release this information, uh, you're going to add any value out there or you're going to create more harm. So I think we are also caught in a dilemma that uh, I don't know how, how personally uh, to get, to get uh, around it. Um, I'd just like to add on that, um, if, if you notice during the uh, last elections, uh, after the election ended, there was a, a period where it, it was like a, a silence period before the, the results came out, and people had started speculating on things that were happening behind the scenes, and I mean, people being kidnapped and whatnot. And, you know, some, those are the, some of the rumors we are monitoring. And um, through uh, the process, actually, when we were, we were sending the messages, there's a, there's a there's a time we had a discussion, a very long discussion even, um, on what to send so that we don't raise more alarm instead of actually um, calming people down. So open, open information and open data can also harm, as you, as you say, but um, I think one of the key things we were trying to, um, to consider was that and sending, sending information that wouldn't necessarily uh, aggravate the situation where people are stuck and wondering what's going on. I mean, uh, how how come the media is not telling us anything? And then there we are with our SMSs sending things that will make you know the situation worse. So those are some of the things we took into consideration, even when sending uh, some of our messages. Yeah. Okay. Right, let's take one last question. Yes, please. Uh, this is probably a question to the gentleman from UNDP. Uh, and it regards uh, the use of the term early warning, because throughout this discussion, yes, I understand how the work that Sisini Amani is doing when they send out uh, alerts or warning messages to individuals in the community, and I can see how that's early warning to those communities. But when I look at, say, maybe the work that uh, the National Steering Committee is doing by collecting information and calling that early warning, I guess what I'm trying to understand better is What's the difference between information collection and early warning in that scenario? Thank you. Well, you're saying that uh, the difference between information collection and early warning? 
yes, if the, if the warning messages are not going back to the individuals in the community who are affected, how then does early warning become different from information collection? I guess this goes back to your question of early warning for whom, which is what I'm asking for more clarification on. Oh, okay, okay. No, I said that that is at a personal level, but uh, what we normally do is that, uh, yes, this information is early warning information, but then, of course, uh, there's that dilemma. One, are you going to warn, if, for instance, it's about a raid on a particular community, are you going to warn that community so that they also arm themselves and wait for the attackers, or uh, that information you only share it with the law enforcement officers who would probably then provide a buffer zone. But that, that is just at a personal level, but uh, I can tell you in practice what we normally do is that uh, this information most of the time on analysis, we look at who are the most uh, suitable recipients of this information. So if it is something to do with the policy change, Okay, so if I may give an example, if it is something to do with the high levels of unemployment, then of course we look for, uh, if it's, uh, you see like uh, what we had in Kenya, Kazi Vijana, it came in so that uh, it could actually uh, create employment, casual employment at least for some of the youth. If you look at, uh, if it is something to do with the issues of uh, open violence, open conflicts, this information, we share it with the law enforcement agencies since they are able to actually uh, contain <coughs> such instances. If it is something to do with tensions, then we actually, we have what we call sub-county peace committees. Then we actually give them uh, funds so that they hold inter-community dialogue meetings so they are able to diffuse those tensions. If it is in places where we believe that a certain <coughs> civil society organization is able to bring the people together, then we talk with that civil society organization from within our partnerships because they have that acceptability in a particular area. So it, the only problem comes in when uh, it is an issue of uh, giving this information to the people who are subject to a target. Because either you tell them that and you have them uh, running away, or you tell them that and you have them arming themselves in readiness for retaliatory. But actually, that, that's, that's not really a big issue. The issue is actually having the information being shared with the most suitable respondent in a specific issue. Okay, excellent. Thank you for your patience. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists, and uh, it's, it's lunchtime.